Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event this evening. I am Mia Van Lewin, member of the Faculty of Fine Arts, co-chair of this year's Women Scholars Speaker Series and visitor here on Treaty 7 territory. We want to begin by acknowledging that we are living, studying, and working in Blackfoot Confederacy territory and in Métis Region 3. We would like to give recognition to both the Nietzsche past, present, and future, and the Métis people. We also want to acknowledge that this virtual platform in which we are meeting is not separate from the physical world each of us inhabits in our daily lives. And as such, it's important for us to consider how it relates to the histories of and ongoing struggles over space, land, and place. Thank you, Mia. My name is Julie Young. I'm a member of the Department of Geography and Environment and the other co-chair of the Women Scholars Speaker Series. This evening, the Support Network for Academics of Color Plus, SNAC Plus, and the Alberta Human Rights Commission Education and Multiculturalism Fund, in collaboration with the Women Scholars Speaker Series, present Dr. Nisha Nath on The Letters, EDI and Tracing Work in the Academy. Tonight's session will be moderated by Caroline Hodes, sorry, Dr. Caroline Hodes, Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Lethbridge, and member of SNAC Plus, as well as a co-applicant on the Rights Equity Diversity Project. The webinar will conclude with a roundtable discussion by University of Lethbridge faculty and SNAC Plus members, Gulden Oskan, Gideon Fujiwara, Glenda Bonifacio, and Soria Das. Now tonight's webinar is being recorded as, will you, as you will have noted as you logged in, and there are two parts. So we will begin with a pre-recorded presentation by Dr. Nath of approximately 30 minutes that will be followed by this roundtable discussion. And note that you can ask questions both while the video plays and during the roundtable discussion through the Q&A chat function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. So now let's welcome Dr. Caroline Hodes, who spearheaded this event and who will provide some important context. Welcome everyone tonight. Um, I'm so glad you could all make it and tune into this webinar. I'd like to first uh, say thank you to Julie. Um, and I'd like to begin by thanking the Nyatsitapi, the original peoples of the Blackfoot Confederacy Territory and the Métis people of Region 3. I would also like to thank Mia for her outstanding direction behind the scenes on this event, Catherine Reeder for her technical expertise, time and video editing skills. Um, you have saved this event. Without you, we couldn't have put it on. And Abigail Shakespeare for the advertising social media presence and her direction for this event. Finally, I'd like to thank Women Scholars Speaker Series and in particular Julie and Mia for providing the additional financial and technical support to make this event possible. Without Women Scholars, we wouldn't be here tonight. So this event has a big kind of history to it. <laughs> it's been in the works for several months now, uh, probably about eight months, I would say. Um, it was originally scheduled and funded by the Human Rights Commission um, of Alberta's Human Rights Education and Multiculturalism Program by grant that has actually since been defunded by the current UCP administration. The name, content, scope, and amount of the anti-racism grants that were once available under the Human Rights Education and Multiculturalism Fund have been renamed and amalgamated with other sources, making funding more competitive and providing less funding per applicant um, than the previous programs. So what was previously called the Anti-Racism Community Grant, in keeping with the name of the Federal Anti-Racism Action Program and Ontario's more streamlined approach under the Anti-Racism Directorate following their provincial mandate under the Anti-Racism Act has been renamed the Multiculturalism, Indigenous and Inclusion Grant. And despite a documented increase in racial diversity across the province and a concurrent rise in reported racially motivated hate crimes between 2014 and 2017, including an increase in activity on the part of extremist white supremacist groups, funding for anti-racist initiatives um, has been one of the casualties of the UCP government's 2019 austerity budget. 
So this talk, therefore, is one of the last events funded by explicitly anti-racist provincially supported programming in Alberta. It was originally meant to take place in March of 2019 and form part of a workshop and consultation on equity, diversity and inclusion with faculty members, students and staff to identify needs, longstanding grievances and the resources that are available or unavailable, as the case may be, on both the University of Lethbridge and Lethbridge College campus. Campuses. Fortunately, we were still able to consult with Dr. Nath over Zoom and interview her, but we had to cancel her talk due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In recognition of the labor, which will be a significant part of this talk that went into creating her pre-COVID presentation, we consulted with Women's Scholar Speaker Series to provide additional funding for a post-COVID presentation, and so here we are tonight. I'd like to thank Dr. Nath first for her long-standing and outstanding contributions to anti-racist work both inside and outside the academy. She's a tireless academic, scholar, teacher, and mother of two beautiful children. She's an assistant professor of equity studies in the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies at Athabasca University, and currently working on two major projects implicating race, security, gender, and citizenship. One is focused on relational securitization in Canada, and the other is an interdisciplinary project with Willow Allen on the settler colonial socialization of public sector workers that's funded by the Shirk Insight Development Program. Her current talk this evening emerges out of a larger project with Davina Bandar and Anita Gurban, who are both at, the, at Athabasca University, and Rita Damoon at the University of Victoria entitled The Letters. So without further ado, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'd like to present Dr. Nisha Nath on The Letters, EDI and Tracing Work in the Academe. Let me start by thanking Dr. Caroline Hodes for this generous invitation. I feel quite honored and humbled to be part of this series. I'm also grateful to the roundtable participants for lending your time, energy, and expertise. This feels important to be grounding this talk in your local campus context in Treaty 7. My name is Nisha Nath. I'm an assistant professor of equity studies at Athabasca University. I'm here in Amiskwichiwiskaya Cat on Treaty 6 territory, where I was born. I've been thinking a lot about how we trace where we are and who we are in place, especially as I witness my two young children doing distance learning at home. We are truly in a time of deep colonizing where we move from orange shirt day to units on the regions of Alberta and quote natural resources with not one mention of treaty or in my context of the Cree, Dene, Nitsitapi, Soto, Nakurasu, and the Métis. So in the talk, I do one kind of tracing that must be positioned with another kind of ongoing tracing for those of us who are settlers, but also committed to decolonial and anti-racist praxis. I also want to acknowledge that I'm recording this early at a time where we are collectively on the verge of a catastrophic rise in COVID-19 cases, where we know that the impact will be borne unevenly because of systemic oppression, particularly in a provincial context where the public and labor are under attack by the state. This is also before the US election, hence this is a time of deep precarity and risk, where we don't know what will unfold by this time next week. So the context of this talk is one of uncertainty, which is fitting because the letters are also always marked by a gap in time and space. It's unclear how the letter I am writing to you right now will or can be received next week, nor if I would write it the same way. So to begin, if I were in a room with you, I'd start by asking you about your letters. Who in this room has written a letter in the past two to three weeks? This might be a letter or an email, something with an opening salutation and a signing off, and something that anticipates a corresponding response. And then I'd ask, how many of you have written a letter advocating for something in the academy? This might lead to fewer hands. How many of you have written a letter advocating for someone, yourself, your students, your research participants, your co-creators, your community, a letter in which you felt risk? And then I would ask how long you'd spent on this letter. If 
if you wanted to write it, whether it was crafted strategically, did you anticipate a backlash, hence write something airtight? Did you think and rethink about whether to send it, engaging in an in-depth consultation process with those who you trust the most? And I suspect that the numbers would dwindle further and that we might look at each other in the room with recognition, because I imagine that the people left with their hands up in the room would have a lot in common structurally. So the genesis for this talk is two sets of letters that converge. The first being the letters EDI, where equity, diversity, and inclusion have become bundled together in shorthand, almost trademarked within the academy. And the second set of letters are actual letters. And the point I wanna to make today is simple. These letters matter, and they matter because they offer an opening to explore the circulation of work within the academy, and they matter because in illuminating this, they tell us something about how EDI works on us. Today, I'll present a topology of three institutionalized epistolary relationalities, the university to us, us to the university, and us to each other. And I use the word us with care to signal those who experience structured precarity in the EDI institution while at the same time remembering that those experiences of structural violence vary and that some of us are often adjacent to and participate in those violences. So I'm arguing three things. First, letter writing within universities is a social practice that is revealing of both the form and content of the EEI Academy. Second, the letters are also an archive revealing a body of analytically rich, intentional, strategic, undocumented, unpublished work written by those who experienced the academy in the most precarious ways. And third, documenting these letters matters, particularly given Rita de Moon's reminder that racism within the academy is a workload and bargaining issue. So the impetus for this talk started one week where all the letters were converging and there was simply a moment where I noticed the work a letter to my childcare provider, belaboring over content, tone, and intent, intense collective writing of the union's equity committee regarding a troubling EDI process my institution was embarking on, and my preparations for a talk on white supremacy and toxic masculinity in the classroom, which involved sifting through old files to pull out letters I will save in perpetuity as documentation and protection. And if I were to total up the hours that I spent on letters, these would be hours lost in an EDI academy where these letters do not count. And just like when you buy something new and you see it everywhere, the letters were suddenly everywhere. So what is a letter? Letters are documents that signal epistolary intent. And as Liz Stanley explains, epistolary intent involves the intention to communicate and in, in some kind of representational medium to someone who is removed in time and space. And engaging in this communication, there is an opening for a response. The writer of the letter who is here has in mind an intended reader who is there. The letter is meant to close that gap of space and time, but the writer must anticipate how distance will impact that message. So as Barton and Hall note, there are two worlds invoked, quote, the here and now of the writer and the here and now of the reader. They also note that letters are most revealing when viewed as a social practice. They gain meaning from social location and they mediate a huge range of human interactions written for, with different purposes, so narration, description, explanation, instruction, argument, and housed in different vehicles, faxes, journals, postcards, open letters, and emails. Moreover, some people perceive of themselves as letter writers and others don't. So the act of writing a letter, who takes up the quill, represents a structured encounter. And letters themselves, with respect to form, display power in that regards too. So in multiple ways, letters occupy an interstitial space. They are both impersonal and personal, intimate yet public. First are the letters written by the institution to us. So these are often open letters written to a campus community. They trade on supposedly collective values and shared meanings, and they teeter on the border of being a statement in that there is an expectation that they will be read, but no presumption that there will be any sort of writing back. 
Now, in the past six months, the letters have been collecting letters written by the institution and those who carry it, and ones written by the institution and those ones written by those the institution bears down upon. The letters I became specifically interested in were the ones coming out fast and furious in response to the mass uprising, resistance and refusals to anti-Black racism and state-sponsored violence in the US and Canada. As a way to think through my own accountabilities, I wanted to locate this talk in this particular moment that of course has a longer lineage. And so I started looking at institutional letters expressing a commitment to address anti-Black racism in the academy. I'm going to offer some reflections on the attributes of these letters based on my first dive into a selection of them. And here I'm thinking broadly about the work that is generally done in this epistolary encounter. Now, of importance, the context for these institutional letters is one of deep grief over the structured violence targeting Black lives. Violence through racial capitalism, state-sponsored carceral terror, and the necropolitics of the pandemic. But to be clear, this is not a context of institutional grief. So you have this moment in the summer of 2020 where it becomes impossible to look away from the murders of Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, Tony McDay, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. And it becomes impossible to look away because of this lineage of Black resistance and liberation with the movement for Black lives organizing, a politics of abolition surging, and also the murderous backlash against this uprising. And you have universities in Canada and the US built upon anti-Black racism and settler colonial violence witnessing this and pressed to respond, and they do with the letters. So what to make of these letters? Now, in many ways, these institutional letters share some similarities to the diversity documentation that Sarah Ahmed has written about. So I want to be in conversation with her here. So first, letters like documents are things that are circulating alongside other things and they are productive in how they define the institution. Ahmed describes how the university is its documents and that these documents bring the university into existence. So like documents, these letters are authorized by the institution. They are statement making about the institution, that the institution is a certain way, has certain qualities and is already doing and is animated to do certain things. Consequently, documents and letters are performative. Excerpt, the faculty stands with all those who seek a world free from the racism. The university stands with those opposing racism. We must all speak out. What I believe and what we believe at the university is that racist belief systems have no place in a just world. Ahmed also describes how commitments to EDI and documents, or in this case, commitments to fighting anti-Black anti -black racism, occupy a dual temporality. They describe the university's forward-looking commitment, but establish these commitments as qualities the university already possesses. The same can be said for letters. The university is committed to continuously learning and seeking truth. We have the opportunity to confront and explore. In the process, we learn about ourselves and more importantly about each other. I know that I speak for the whole faculty. We stand in solidarity. We commit to being reliable, authentic allies. Like Ahmed's documents, sometimes these commitments are referential. For example, they may cite another commitment or another document as the starting point. Here, the utterance of a commitment in the now is framed reactively as a requirement, as Ahmed tell, tells us. There are a number of ways to get involved, to make change, become educated, challenge racist thinking, familiarize yourself with the university's policies and processes, share your knowledge with others. Using our strategic plan and the initiative as our guide, we will continue to pursue both short and long-term strategies. We deliver diversity dialogue workshops. We are strong champions of the Federal Dimensions Program. We embrace and commit to implement the principles of this program. Further, as Ahmed explains, these commitments become constitutive of the university. These become the origin story, as opposed to the reality that universities 
are spaces structured in and through white supremacy, settler colonialism, heteropatriarchy, imperialism and racial capitalism, transphobic violence and ableism. As Aben notes, these are powerful speech acts. As the institution prides itself as being good at hearing, quote, it refuses to hear complaint by saying that it does hear complaint, end quote. The university is committed. That includes our work and efforts to ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion are woven into the fabric of everything we do. We will continue to listen and act on our responsibilities to bear witness. Let's remember that the context for these letters is an ongoing organizing logic of white supremacy within the academy, where whiteness is transmitted through institutionalized approaches to EDI and what Joyce Green has termed reconciliation, WR, through racialized conceptions of knowledge and expertise that devalue Black, Indigenous, people of color and function as a, quote, settler colonial curricular project of replacement through risk management on campuses and the targeted surveillance of Black, Indigenous people of color, through hiring practices and governance, through academic violences like microaggressions, tenure denials, and grant applications that require a recoding of insurgent, insurrectionary, and decolonial work, through financial investments and pensions that trade on racial capitalism, extractivism, imperialism, occupation, and militarization, through classrooms where the legitimacy, authority, emotional and physical safety of Indigenous, Black and people of color, queer and trans students, contingent faculty and faculty are compromised. And through labor policies trading on the unrecognized work of Black, Indigenous people of color. So by institutional sleight of hand, the letters work much like Ahmed's documents, working to, quote, change perceptions of whiteness rather than changing the whiteness of organizations, end quote. Documents and letters are useful to the university to measure good performance. As Ahmed explains, they become fetish objects, where the presumption is that the more a document circulates, the more it will do. Visibility of the well-structured letter or the well-written letter is a currency, a visibility that can in fact contribute to invisibility of ongoing structural violence and structured inertia. There are differences though. Unlike documents, there is no pretense about voice and process in the production of these letters. These letters are not usually born from a supposedly lateral, transparent, collective and consultative process. While in some ways, assertions of public accountability the process through which these letters are written means they can simultaneously speak with an authoritative singularity, but also be jettisoned aside or put off on matters of process. This, with, as with all these attributes, is of course subject to contestation, as we see with this recent institutional response to its own letter. Recently, we issued a statement on anti-Black racism. While we engaged with our own staff in drafting the statement, we did not reach out to other campus organizations. We neglected to consult widely with Black leaders on our campus. Instead, we prioritized our internal pressures and sense of urgency. For this, we apologize. In light of this, and with apologies to Black students, staff, and faculty, the institution retracts its statement. The letters also speak in a reactive register. In that, though, the documents and the letters are similar in that they are often produced in a situation of pressure and in their urgent reactivity, they expose the structural inertia of the EDI Academy with respect to anti-racism and decolonial work. While both documents and letters play with temporality, this manifests differently, albeit with similar effect. Stanley writes that letters are marked by their quotidian present, calling them dead letters because the letter that was written and sent is different than the one that arrives and is received. With a lack of process in the way these institutional letter letters fix time with their authoritative rendering of how things are, the letters support critiques that anti-racist equality or decolonization is forever promised in the future. 
as Tuck and Yang described vis-a-vis -vis justice in a colonial context, quote, a temporality always desired and deferred and delimited by the timeframes of institutions concerned with their self-historicizing, self-perpetuating futurities. Education plays a vital role in it, raising awareness about racism, and we will work to confront and reject all manifestations of discrimination. Education raises people up and brings us together. We embrace and celebrate the diversity of our community, our learners, and our team. A critical difference between documents and letters is that these letters evoke a distinctive intimacy. Dear campus community member, dear campus family, dear Nisha, we are in this together. We want to protect our campus family. Yet if we re reflect back to the organizing logics of the institution and the deep disjunctures between the letters and reality, the EDI Academy is not the caring, reciprocal, relational academy. We see this so clearly in the recent case of Ottawa U and the jump to defend free speech and academic freedom in the context of a professor's use of an anti-Black racist slur. Yet in this same temporal moment, human rights scholar Valentina Azarova's offer of employment is rescinded by the U of T because of her research on Israel's policies of occupation and the government of Ontario is poised to adopt by order and counsel Bill 168 which would include a definition of anti-Semitism that would characterize criticism of Israel's policies towards Palestinians as anti-Semitic. So the letters are a tangle in the EDI Academy where the intimacy of the letter is disciplinary, something we see in invocations to dialogue. This intimacy is powerful, evoking commitment not of the institution, but commitment of us to be loyal, gracious, supportive, civil, team members, or institutional champions to conjure language that Ahmed exposes us to, language that continues to be used in present day with terms like EDI champions. The letters are shrouded in institutional niceness and good intentions, but good intentions have historically been imprinted upon exalted national subjects and simultaneously have enacted extraordinary colonial and racist harm. So without collapsing structures of domination or different structures of domination, Rose's concept of deep colonizing is helpful here to name this process wherein, quote, conquest is embedded within institutions and practices which are said to be aimed toward reversing those same processes. And so with these qualities or attributes in mind, we can think to the responses of our varied institutions and what work is being done in these letters that border on statements or vice versa. Well, I won't read it fully, given the current iteration of institutional racism at Ottawa U is just one example, we can turn back to Ottawa U's letter or statement from May expressing the institution's horror and outrage over systemic racism and its stand of solidarity with Black students, faculty, and staff. The letters support an institution that pretends not to be what it is. So this is some powerful institutional gaslighting. Dear institution, yours truly us. We know that institutionalized EDI can affect a curious erasure of groups experiencing structured oppression, both in terms of centering dominance for example, whiteness, but also in terms of extracting but simultaneously erasing the labor of groups often described as equity seeking. Rita de Moon reminds us that in 2015, the Canadian Association of University Teachers adopted a policy statement on just this fact. I'll adopt her practice by quoting a portion of this policy at length. Academic staff who are also members of equity seeking groups are frequently called upon to perform extra duties such as interpreting documents through an equity lens, providing liaison with community groups, mentoring and advising, providing media contact, writing reports that address concerns, serving on committees, and finding and con contacting people who work in the area of equity in higher education. Members of equity seeking groups are often called on to conduct research for up to date information about equity in higher education, even when it is not within their area of academic research. Requests for additional work come not only from a variety of administrative and department sources, but also from academic staff associations, 
Such work receives little official recognition and adds an unfair burden to the workload of members of equity seeking groups, thus creating another equity problem. The letters we write are another manifestation of not just the power structures that underscore the imperative to write letters, but the extra survival and political work that we undertake that has no institutional value when connected to our labor, but requires extraordinary stamina, energy, fortitude, skill, analysis, and time. So I want to reflect on a spectacular letter that is simultaneously unremarkable, given how ubiquitous this work is for many of us. And it's a letter written by Dr. Dr. Deborah Thompson. She's an associate professor at McGill University in their politics department and a leading expert on the politics of race. And I sought her permission to draw from her letter that has been widely circulated at this point. So in this 2800 word letter, Thompson begins with a letter in the form of an email from the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards at the University of Oregon. An email that expressed that office's assertion that, quote, we must be actively anti-racist. In what follows, Thompson goes on to describe eight months in which she supported a first-generation student of color navigate the student conduct process. She writes, quote, not only has this experience been a time-consuming, soul-destroying, bureaucratic nightmare, but more importantly, it is literally the epitome of the pervasive, surreptitious, and procedurally protected institutional racism at the university. So in this letter, we see Thompson's contextualized analysis of systemic racism in the academy, her careful discursive reading of institutional text, her teaching of critical race theory fundamentals, her praxis of connecting analysis to her grounded experience, her emphatic and skilled advocacy, her assertion of her own credentials, her piecing together of a timeline with each documented moment historically contextualized, her work reminiscent of a consultant identifying gaps, disjunctures, and contradictions in university policy, and her bravery in voicing this analysis of institutional white supremacy unapologetically all the while naming and anticipating the professional backlash she might receive. She writes, I could go on for days because helping the student has required months of exactly the kind of unpaid, unacknowledged, invisible labor that disproportionately falls on black faculty. Now, the letters of this ilk come in diverse iterations, but there are a few attributes I want to highlight about them. First, these letters are neither isolated nor infrequent. They form a regular part of our workload, yet are not formally designated as such. Indeed, as we consider Thompson's letter, both her labor and her students is implicated. The letter becomes a snapshot of tracing work within the academy, as the work to get to this letter is remarkable, not to mention the writing itself and everything that follows. Second, as with Ahmed's assertion that documents are often produced by individuals in situations of extreme pressure, this is not unlike letters. Often we are called in to do crisis management by the institution or through our own politics and sense of accountability. In this urgency, the letters do become a differently understood kind of life writing, but they are letters that also derail us from life. Third is the work. The letter is rarely if ever recognized as work nor as having value. The letter does not get to become part of the document. This careful, intensive, epistolary work becomes undocumented, invisible work. The drafting and redrafting, the research, the consultation, the peer review, the strategy, the analysis, the second guessing, the regret. And of course, the work and originary experiences and affect that fuel the letter and emerge because of the conditions informing the letter. These letters are some of our best writing, seminal texts. And critically, this work becomes almost invisible to ourselves because it can be painful to recuperate and almost impossible to keep track of because of the volume. So in 2020, Rita de Moon published an imperative piece to read, and in it she argues that racism and colonialism in the academy are issues of workload and bargaining for at least two reasons. First, that racism has implications for the distribution and division of labor. And second, this is work that is unaccounted for within the EDI Academy. This work is overwhelmingly carried 
by Black, Indigenous, and other faculty of color as they cannot step away. In the EDI Academy, work is coded in a particular way. This includes how unions and faculty associations think of work. Damoon tells us that racism and workload are treated as two distinct domains of academic life. Now, when we look at how Black, Indigenous, and other faculty of color work and the nature of their work across teaching, research, service, and what she describes as fugitive work, institutional cultural work, racism is entangled throughout and doesn't simply manifest as a matter of discrimination, harassment, or human rights, those being the typical registers in which EDI function. As Damoon reminds us, these kinds of labor demands are also made of cis women, lesbian, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming folks of color, and of course those with institutionally precarious and contingent positions. The letters are just one part of this ongoing, accruing, weighty work, work that's not value, but also work that collects in our bones. Dear us with love us. So I'm gonna be brief here in part because this is an intimate yet collective modality of life writing, survival work, dissidence. And it's an epistolary modality that we do have and can use to betray the EDI Academy, white supremacy, settler colonialism, heteropatriarchy, transmisogyny, and ableism. As Eve Tuck has asked, quote, what might it mean to bite the university that feeds us? So this correspondence of intimacy, or letter writing and organizing, is not solely reactive. It is enduring and sustaining and cannot be bound or controlled by the EDI Academy. While being careful not to collapse Tuck's specific analysis of the settler colonial university and what that means for Indigenous scholars and communities, her words are generative and instructive. Quote, there are some forms of knowledge that the Academy doesn't deserve. This is an epistolary relationality that is important to recognize so that we are not overdetermined in and by the university. This is the particular risk of the EDI Academy for quote unquote equity seeking groups. These are the letters we write amongst ourselves that are rooted in strategy, humor, care, analysis, forgiveness, reflection, mobilization, empathy, rage, and critique. And these are letters that we should pay attention to as a dissident praxis as we navigate the other epistolary encounters we are pulled into. So in this gesture to pay attention to and honor, we might turn to Leila Gandhi's notion of dissident friendship. And it's a notion that was introduced to me by Davina Bandar, Anita Gervin, and Rita Damoon, all of whom are engaged in the work on the letters with me. Gandhi describes dissonant friendships as, quote, all those invisible affective gestures that refuse alignment, end quote. A relationality where power does not monopolize our subjectivities, but a set of enduring intimate encounters that constitute, quote, a breach in the fabric of imperial inhospitality. We can add here a breach to the neoliberal EDI Academy. And so in this epistolary relationality, there are moments where, as Jackie Alexander writes, quote, even the most egregious signatures of new empire are not the sole organizing nexus of subjectivity. Within the EDI Academy, within this correspondence of intimacy, we become accomplices to each other. So my objective today was simple to describe how the letters tell us something about the EDI Academy that the Academy won't reveal about itself. To be clear, the intention here hasn't been to encourage the institution to write better letters or to signal that the letters by the institution don't shift over time, aren't resisted, can't be used as leverage for accountability, or to say that the letter writers are good or bad or not well-intentioned. But in unpacking the letters as to practice, we can expose how that intimacy of the performative letter in the neoliberal university can be a trap. Moreover, the letters are just one manifestation of how work circulates in the EDI Academy. So in doing this work, I learned a beautiful word, epistolarium. And Stanley explains that the epistolarium is a heuristic for thinking about letters. 
and it's concerned with the epistolary output of a person or an organizational entity, a gathering up of extant, ex, extant epistolary activity and the correspondence back. And the purpose here is to trace what these letters do, are, and become. And she describes these tracings as focused on the dialogical, perspectival, emergent, and sequential. So the epistolarian can lay bare when someone starts or stops writing, the conditions of one's writing, why they write and shifting reasons over time, who writes back, under what conditions, what letters turn into correspondence and why. And so I end with a question for us all. What are the possibilities and the risks of gathering our epistolarium? For those committed to equity, but called into EDI in harmful ways, what shall we do with the letters? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nath, for what has given us um, enormous food for thought. I was thinking of all the letters <laughs> that we've been writing over the last little while. Um, so instead of the traditional Q&A session um, that happens after these sorts of events, we've opted for a roundtable discussion instead. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Glenda Bonifacio, who's a professor in the Department of Women and Gender Studies, the principal investigator on the RED Project, and one of the founding members of SNAC Plus, the support network for academics and students of color plus allies. Dr. Gulden Ashkan, Assistant Professor of Sociology, an active member of the Gender Equity and Diversity Committee at, for the University of Lethbridge's Faculty Association, and also one of the founding members of SNAC Plus. Dr. Saria Das, Professor of Physics and co-applicant on the RED Project, who is also one of the founding members of SNAC Plus, and Dr. Gideon Fujiwara, Professor of History, Coordinator of the Asian Studies Program, and former member of the President's Advisory Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the University of Lethbridge, and also a founding member of SNAC Plus. Welcome all of you um, tonight. And if anybody would like to start with comments or questions, that would be wonderful. Great talk. Um, I would also like to align thinking about a lot of letters as someone very passionate about the letters in general. I still love to send and receive hundreds of letters to friends and family members. And I write a lot of those letters as survival work as you described in your talk and as part of my advocacy work. While I was actually listening to your talk, I was looking at the half written letter sitting on my desk to be sent to a, an imprisoned friend and colleague and thinking that the reason it is only half written was because all those other survival letters that require so much time and emotional labor got in the, in the way. So your research was really important in that, in that sense and very helpful in putting all those feelings I had towards this part of my professional work in context, in a theoretical framework that I can draw on to make better sense of what I am experiencing, what we are, most of us are all experiencing, I guess, and to make all this labor more visible. So for that, I thank you very much for doing this very important work. There are some other reasons that I'm interested in the topic of letters as part of my ongoing research on the critiques of modernity in the context of the so-called man of letters or the Republic of letters of the 17th and 18th century Europe and the role they played in the Enlightenment thought in constructing citizenship and the public in the Western world. In that sense, the letters as social practice and labor do actually lie at the very heart of the 
modern Western academy. It seems to me that the letters do construct publics to turn certain groups of people into subjects that can be addressed. As in the case of first group of letters you identified coming from the university to us, those letters construct us as the subjects of the university's public, its addressee. In that there are these undeniable hierarchical power relations that you beautifully put within and between the letter writing and receiving publics. For example, an invitation letter to Dr. Nishanet's talk coming from Snack Plus versus coming from Women Scholars Speaker Series would have different power effect in addressing and attracting different publics from within the university community. Or who is writing the EDI letter to the university or to us has certain implications as to how it will be received, read, and responded. In a recent email thread that I was involved in, for example, it took five emails to explain to two faculty members how they are relying on their white privilege and engaging in tone policing towards a racialized faculty members' email. Well, it took only five emails, as we all know, those emails usually take forever. But this time it took only five because the last email, which I currently made, the issue clear for everyone was coming from another white faculty member who happened to refer to neo-Nazis in their email in an effort to explain white privilege and tone policing, while previous emails or letters were perfectly ignored as they were coming from racialized faculty members. This last one was worth taking into account because that particular public of white academics only accepted letters from people that look like them and write in a way that is familiar to them. While other letters coming from racialized faculty were just returned to the sender without being even opened. So your talk made me think about the question of letters' capacity to create, maintain, and communicate with those different publics. I feel like the more I engage in letter writing or email correspondence, the more visible the borders dividing those publics become. A visibility that comes into existence at the expense of invisibility of labor behind the letter writing process. In that sense, my question, I guess, as someone who still values and continues to engage in all kinds of letter writing, I wonder to what extent these letters have the potential to somehow breach those different publics or to what extent they keep enforcing the borders between those different publics. I think a question for all of us to think about. Thank you so much again. So, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Nath, and uh, all of our colleagues and women scholars and Snack Plus. Uh, Nisha's talk was was um, uh, just so profound and um, you know very timely, you know, for the time that we're living in. Uh, this has been a year where um, our eyes have been open to inequities and injustices, uh, racism uh, across society and and within our institutions. And uh, I appreciated how in your talk, uh, you uh, sort of distinguished between the different letters uh, to us, from us, between us. And recently, some colleagues of mine and I, we, um, uh, we, we drafted a letter together uh, regarding, uh, well, actually regarding the upcoming uh, position, uh, uh, the executive director of EDI position that we'll be conducting a, a search for. 
so I will ask Dr. Nath to, to keep your eye out for this uh, job ad when it, when it does come out. Uh, but this, this process of, of um, you know, working on the letter together, it, it was really uh, informative and educational for me. Um, uh, and, uh, but you know, this letter was, I will admit, I mean, it was, a, it was sort of an internal letter. I mean, it wasn't, and it wasn't one that we publicized, even though, um, you know, there was, there was some discussion about, um, you know, po possibly taking that avenue. Uh, just today, uh, I was reading the, the Lethbridge Herald and I, and I saw that, uh, you know, one of our colleagues and, and her students uh, published a very powerful uh, letter. Uh, and this is a public one, obviously addressed to the education minister to ensure that uh, the history of residential schools be included in the uh, K-4 education. Um, and I think recently I joined some of our scholars in, in signing uh, a letter on the same subject written by uh, Dr. Uh, Carla Peck of, of U of A. So, I mean, there are clearly different letters uh, taking on different tones for different uh, reader readerships. And uh, I mean, this past year was not only, I mean, for me, it was, it was also a year of, uh, you know, continuing to find and develop my uh, voice as a, as a scholar. I'm, I'm fin uh, finalizing my book that, that will be coming out next year. And that's for another, uh, that's for another day to talk about. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, finding my voice as a, as a, as a citizen and, um, uh, and, and, you know, finding that, you know, these, these are not mutually exclusive things. Uh, uh, but uh, sort of a question or a comment, I, th I think just that I'll pose at the end. And it's very similar to, I think, to um, perhaps what Goulden uh, said and uh, is, um, yeah, just the, you know, how we might change our tone um, or language, uh, you know, de depending on how we, or who, whom the, the, the letter is addressing. And uh, I've been reading, uh, uh, Sarah Ahmed uh, recently, and um, uh, you know, she speaks about uh, switching between different languages uh, when, when discussing equity and, and diversity, and and um, and so yeah, this is something that I'm uh, you know very interested in, and uh, so yeah, I look forward to others who may uh, chime in on this. Thank you. Next to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, Dr. Nath, for. The, the, uh, the outstanding talk and it's, it was, it was it's an excellent and it's uh, I'd like to uh, echo my my colleagues uh, what they said that uh, it, it's, it, it was very timely and um, Gideon <laughs> I think mentioned last past one year or you know I, I think that the, 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 the situation has changed drastically over the last few years. And of course, it has gotten from bad to worse in many ways in terms of uh, racialization, uh, uh, racial discrimination, and um, uh, racist incidents, hate incidents, and 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 uh, we all know, like we have, I think we have all uh, personal experience and you know anecdotal uh, uh, evidence, and it's it's all over the place, and it's all, it's disheartening to see that, um, as as mentioned, I think. At, in the beginning of the talk while introducing Dr. Nath that uh, in our province too, right? Like the last couple of years, uh, these efforts to to counter or, or, uh, uh, or you know, to help counter these kind of incidents and, and, and it has like the resources have, have fallen drastically. So, so, so the situation I think has, has gotten back to worse. Um, depending on what happens in the US elections, it might get better, I don't know. So we'll see. But uh, uh, so, so uh, Dr. Nath mentioned like various aspects of these issues in, in her talk and, and the connection between them and uh, that to the letters. And um, a couple of things which to, I, I, I found, I mean, uh, all of them are interesting, but one thing I, I especially struck me was was the mention of unsafe classrooms, and I, I, I mean unsafe classrooms. We I think I sort of know what it means, but I was just wondering if at some point of time either Dr. Nath or any of the panelists or anybody from the audience uh, could elaborate a little bit on what one means by that, 
uh, maybe with an example or two, that would be very useful, I think. And uh, I also realized from the talk that we all write letters, of course, and um, unknowingly uh, we put in our biases and sometimes it's for the good, sometimes it's for the bad, but I <laughs> definitely will be more uh, conscious in both reading and writing letters, especially from the, uh, from the you know, administration or, or, or the institution or even colleagues and coworkers. And it's, it's very important to be careful. And I'm just speaking for myself that I personally, I think I'd be even more careful in, in trying to interpret as well as write letters. I mean, they're very powerful elements and as they should be. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for now. I, I hope the discussion continues. So thank you, Dr. Nath again for your excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the land uh, the, the original owners of the land, uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy and their descendants. I am privileged to interact with uh, today and uh, in other spaces in, in the city of Lethbridge and in the university. Tunisia, uh, thank you so much for the letters about equity in the, in the, in the academe. I am kind of like I requested to be the last speaker because um, when you speak about letters or letter writing, it's, it's sort of a, a mark that I tried to engage with um, as a racialized faculty and as uh, with my colleagues here who have, who have pushed you know, the idea of racial justice at the University of Lethbridge uh, for students, staff and faculty. And uh, to see that uh, the support network of academics of color, SNAC Plus, has uh, reached this level is for me a very uh, empowering. Like, uh, like who would thought that in three years and we would be able to have a sort of a, a dialogue or conversation with the women scholars speaker series you know for for the longest time we have uh, uh, submitted names of so-called allies scholars you know like letters saying that about this you could consider this but uh, it has come to fruition now i think in the last uh, little while about a more directed um, views or perspective on racialization, on race in the academy, on equity. I think um, I'm, I'm also, I also requested to be the last speaker because really I don't know how to start because what the Nisha has explained, you know, very eloquently with the scholarly dimension uh, resonates very well, like directly connects with my live reality. Okay, like I've done letters, different tone, <laughs> different ways, uh, different mechanisms. And it, it doesn't stop in the economy because in terms of uh, letters as a labor, my engagement goes beyond the academy itself because as my colleague mentioned, you know, we also are part of, of a community. So I'm not only a member of the academy, I'm not only a part at the University of Lethbridge, but I'm also a mother that my children go to school with, perhaps a bullied, perhaps unfairly treated by their white teachers. So that form of letter writing also connects. So the spaces in which the letters are formed goes beyond what we do in the academy. So as a mother, as a resident, as a citizen, and um, the other sort of thing that connects with my life is that uh, letter writing is a sort of a life story, okay? Like it connects with the, the live reality, the live experience that tries to engage with a space, for example, okay, for letter writing that you perceive to be receptive to the ideas that you hold dear. Like uh, you, for example, I teach in women and gender studies and I do teach in Asian studies. And of course, you know, I'm a Filipino and one of the racialized uh, uh, group in Canada. And also one of those group that, that uh, 
is the is the <laughs> providing the core uh, source for essential workers in Canada under the pandemic. And you look at it, you know, when you actually position yourself, the struggle and the advocacy for fair, for racial justice doesn't only <laughs> uh, begin and ends in the academy. Like for us uh, racialized people in the academy, our struggles and our and the aim for letter writing does not end to the president or to the vice provost or to the dean or to the chair. It does not end there. So in terms of the labor that we, we give, it's an extension of our life. Like, you know, like uh, we cannot say that we stop fighting for racial injustice after five o'clock in the afternoon. Or, you know, I don't care about racism or race or equity of, you know, on a Friday because tomorrow it's a Saturday. It doesn't end there. So uh, letter writing has uh, goes beyond time and goes beyond space. And uh, the so-called libera the liberation or temporary relief that provides us as a way of expressing, you know, uh, like sort of even a desperate call and attempt to use the space for letter writing that somehow, you know, in the edge of that mind of people that we consider as our colleagues in the university, somehow, somewhere, there could be a sense of humanity, the sense of uh, like what I call, I don't know, I don't want this recorded. And, <laughs> and even if I want to say, speak last, it's coming out. So. Uh, I was trying to, to speak about letters as something that has, uh, is a living document. It's not an archive. The letter is a dead document if you actually stop engaging in the context of the letter from which you write. But it is a living document. It's a living, it's a re, uh, it transforms, it evolves, uh, it could be rewritten, it could have you know, a different life. And it, it's part of that uh, consideration up to what point are you able to engage? Because we have to agree and accept the fact that at some point in our life of letter writing, there will be an end that this space is not any more conducive for further engagement because you ask, what for? Do you care? Thank you. So much to everybody on the panel. Um, Nisha, did, did you want to, to take the questions that everyone's asked? There are also two questions in the Q&A um, that can possibly be addressed as well. So first, let me say um, kind of a live thank you to you all. Thank you to you, Caroline, who is not just a brilliant scholar, but like a dear old friend too. So, um, uh, and one of the best letter writers that I, that I know quite quite um, truly. And I also wanted to thank, um, and this relates to kind of some of what you've raised, I wanted to thank all the panelists um, so much for your, your um, for take, first of all, for taking this work seriously, because that is um, kind of truly an honor. Um, but then also for your labor in taking this work seriously and for um, doing some of that affective work that um, is required to feel that sense of relationality with what what I spoke about today, because that also is painful, painful work to be thinking about those letters as I'm speaking about those letters. So I um, have a lot of deep appreciation for that. And I guess, I mean, as opposed to, you've all raised some beautiful questions, but one of the things that I'm hoping maybe we could, could talk about is in some ways, um, the question that I, ended with because I wanted to do a round table as opposed to this just being about me saying stuff to all of you in the ether. Um, because I think that a lot of what happens in the EDI Academy is that we, um, you know, as EDI becomes this trademark bundle, um, we also come away, get torn away, pulled apart from each other. And especially now in this context of, of um, kind of this digital um, way of being with each other. And so for me, this, this coming together um, to collectively reflect on this body of work that we all have been contributing to in the form of the letters um, is in part 
I think a breach of that EDI Academy that doesn't actually want us to come together in collectives. And so I think I am just genuinely curious about how we take this moment where we can be together and, and recognizing each other's labor um, in terms of these letters and what we do with them, right? How do we, what becomes the next step? How do we acknowledge as QC, I see you've, you've written a beautiful question as, as per usual. Um, how do we, what do we do with that? historical and emotional weight that QC is talking about in the question um, space. And what do we do with that rage? What do we do with that labor? What do we do with how we acknowledge and name that violence through the letters? Because um, as many of you have, you have noted, there are also such generative letters that we're writing with each other, um, alongside each other. So I kind of want to turn the question back to all of us collectively to think about what do we do with these letters? What do we do? Forms part of my other book. <laughs> 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 well, I think seriously, the the letters uh, at how they are actually evolve in. Uh, you may have the printed version, but now the email, you know, the email is now a different site for collecting these letters, and uh, yeah. So seriously, you could. You could contextualize, for example, it could be a basis of your of your autobiography, you know, like my life at the University of Lethbridge in the last 15 years, you know, or my life in the in Lethbridge for the last, or my in Canada for the last how many years? So uh, it's an extension of actually providing that basis for, you know. The, the moment in which you live at that time, you know, at that historical moment, like a testament to what we did. So individually and collectively, it could be, it could be a source for scholarship, you know, like uh, there are many letters in the archive that many students would actually look, look into, to look into the situation uh, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, or how many years ago? So in the same in the same manner that you could actually put together, you know, like collectively, like like an institutional sort of uh, memory. So for example, for Snack Plus, it could be a way for us to look back into what letters we produced in the last three years, and forms part of our collective, you know, you know. The, our collective action that uh, brings us to to somewhere, and uh, what you know, for every word we write, I don't think it should be thrashed or should be just uh, lying out there. But we could find a meaning into a further exploration of our participation, you know, as uh, as workers in the academy. And then as workers, we have simultaneous or multiple a relation with other spaces, you know, as citizen, as a resident, you know, as, as what in, in that sense. So that would be my contribution about what we should do about the letters. Maybe I can comment a little bit following on Blender's point, especially Snack Plus we've been considering to publicize some of the letters that we write at Snack Plus to certain university ad administration. For example, the last one we wrote about the EDI, about the EDI hire, how it should be, how the hiring committee should be formed and what concerns they should have in drafting the call for uh, this EDI person. So we wanted to discuss the possibility of publicizing those letters that were sent to the university administration in an effort to make them more visible and also um, exemplify the good practices of letter writing or contributing to the university governance. Another way that we have been discussing this is to include those letters in our professional activities reports. Um, it is something, it is a way 
to make that work visible to those eyes who want to see those uh, letters or that labor involved in letter writing process, I guess. Um, but it could be different from faculty to faculty, depending on what DM will, how the DMs will take it. Um, maybe it's a question for Alpha too, uh, our faculty association, to revisit how our PARs, the professional activities reports, are structured and to have a space for that kind of activity to be included in tenure and promotion files. And I think another function of those letters is to create community, not the kind of community I was telling uh, earlier, but the kind of community that um, you were in your talk, Misha, talking about. Um, because both the letter writing process and the responses that we receive those letters are painful processes. It is too painful to handle alone. So that helps us to create this community of support. Um, and I think that is very important that in a sense, if you if are lucky enough, helping us to create that community, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, uh, Gwenda and, and Gulden. Um, if I if I might just add a, a couple of points. Uh, I mean, I, I would con consider myself uh, probably a novice when it comes to, you know, letter writing, uh, you know, in an academic setting, even though, you know, obviously I've done, you know, applications and grant applications and things like that. But, but I, I do, um, I mean, in that sense, I think this year has been a time of self-reflection and, you know, growth, probably at our various paces, you know, my, uh, me with mine. Um, but I think certainly, um, you know, what to do with letters. Um, I mean, reading other people's letters, right? And uh, sort of reading them over three times and, um, you know, making a informed decision, you know, to sign onto a letter or a petition. I mean, that's, I think that's sort of, um, uh, I don't know, vicariously, uh, you're not writing the letter, but you know, you're, you're um, sort of signing on uh, in some cases. Uh, the, yeah, the exercise that we, we were doing as, as um, uh, Goulden was describing, uh, you know, that was certainly, um, you know, for some, I'm sure some of my colleagues, I mean, they're so seasoned, you know, you know, they, I mean, they've written letters to, um, you know, um, you know, that are much, you know, public, obviously, or, you know, um, editorials, you know, and, and such, but um it it was it certainly did i think create a you know um, stronger bonds within you know within the, the our community and uh um but uh but yeah i mean there's also that whole uh realm of you know social media which you know i'm not quite quite a part of and i mean i i sort of observe others and and you know the activity going on but uh but i think yeah it's probably i don't know for me i think it's been about sort of i mean uh you know just sort of uh, finding your position, if you will, and, and um, you know, uh, contributing a, a voice, you know, uh, uh, or trying to contribute a voice um, at an appropriate time. But it, it's, it's certainly, um, yeah, a work in progress for myself. Thanks. Yeah, I think one, one point about letter writing is that sometimes the the writing of the letter has to be at the moment you know at the time it should be there like some of the responses to letter cannot wait you know like uh, in a week and some and those letters reflect you know that that emotion that goes with that letter and it captures the essence of you know what you're trying to drive at um, the way that you do it of course um, resonates with the your social location, you know, like what you are. Um, particularly for for what you say, IDE work in the University of Lethbridge, where uh, it's still questioned. The validity of BDI as a brand is questioned, you know, uh, by by some by most of what they call uh, leaders. Say 
maybe mid management level that there's this sort of a of a question of equating this work with something else that is which is not uh, um, the way it should be so you continue you know the letter writing but sometimes you know the energy of letter writing uh, gets a toll and uh, you think about it like uh, do we stop do we engage do we continue but uh, in in our, in in some contexts like the university of lethbridge which is small your uh, racialized faculty you know are counted so visible that you can't escape uh, compared to a bigger university like uh, it could be you know one in a thousand you know and you you would be invisible but the invisibility and the visibility of the topic you want to engage with easily identifies who is talking, who's writing in a small university like Lethbridge. So there's a difference between the impact that perhaps you're able to do or being questioned at why you do it and also question yourself, why do you have to do it, you know? But uh, in activist language, you know, if you don't do it, who will? Are you going to wait for somebody to write it for you? Um, would you have uh, the mechanism to sort of get a group and say, okay, this is the, this is the situation, we have to write, we have to do something. And sometimes it, uh, it requires immediate action, you know, like immediate writing <laughs> to say that you capture the moment and uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's good, you know, so for me, it's uh, it saves me a thousand dollars going to a therapy. You know, writing is liberation. <laughs> writing is a form. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a, an ability for racialized faculty to engage in a space they want to, and provides you know an access to whoever the power might be, their leadership, and the structures that may or may not be listening to you. And you and uh, once you have it, you know you don't care. You sort of a uh, the thought, you know, the throwing the thorn away, you know, from your heart, because uh, as I said, you know, the writing, the word is not simply an ink. If the, if emails would have colors, you know, if the keyboard would have colors, for me, if I do the writing, it would be red, 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 red. So that's why the project is red, Rights Equity Diversity Project in that sense. Um, there's a question there, you know, about uh, in the Q&A that perhaps uh, some of you might be able to respond. Yes, um, Amy Lambert is asking uh, what the possible implications of having an institutional role of EDI, because here at the University of Lethbridge, we don't even have the neoliberal EDI office. And, and we are in the process of try, trying to hire one administrative role, an EDI um, VP uh, to support our current um, academic infrastructure, I suppose. And there's a lot of resistance to that because of the austerity budget, because of all the cuts, why should we create a new role that requires a new salary, et cetera, and so forth. So there's that argument. And then there's the argument about, well, we need something because we have nothing and nothing's being done. And then that comes back to the letters because there's this constant demand for evidence. Well, we need more evidence that racism exists on campus, right? And, and the letters are the repository of evidence of all the racism that exists on campus, of all the sexism that exists on campus, right? All of these letters together combined. I mean, I can't even imagine if over the years we combined all the letters, how many documents there would be if you printed them off, how many trees would have to die for that particular repository, epistol epistolary, you know, epistolarium as you were describing it to, to exist in a material form. And so, so, is it a case of you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't? I mean, how, how do you integrate this kind of thing into an institutional context or do you? Or do we do something with the letters instead? Uh, 
And I think if I'm if I'm going to add, uh, because uh, when you speak about the EDI as a position, you know, in a white academy, it's like the EDI position is the it's like the second coming, <laughs> second coming for something like the salvation. That office would be the salvation or the miracle runner to solve, you know, EDI at the University of Lethbridge. Well. In terms of going to the progressive, you know, kind of let is uh, way behind. Like having a position of EDI is uh, commendable to have an institutional commitment to EDI. And then, it, but doesn't mean that EDI stops with that person because EDI is everybody's business, okay? Every, uh, to develop and promote the culture of inclusion and uh, uh, say, yeah, for for all of the equity deserving group, it requires everybody from point A to point two, whatever, everybody, all of us, students, staff, faculty, okay? We have racist faculty, we have racist students, we have racist staff, okay? And here comes a person as an EDI trying to actually change, you know, a behavior or an attitude that would take maybe generations for the person to do, for society to do. But uh, the EDI as a position is a starting point from which we actually engage. So students, staff and faculty engage in, in, that, uh, in that role. So the role is, so uh, if it's like a, if it's like a, so if it's like a bacteria, we become the bacteria to infect the academy to become non-racist. So even if EDI is just a work to make it anti-racist, we need the bacteria to infect everybody. So that would be my uh, application of COVID-19 <laughs> way in, in, in responding to the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, yeah, the important question. If I can just add my two cents here. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we're hoping that, you know, somebody, you know, with the, I mean, who's trained and experienced and has that, you know, trained eye will be able to come in and help us to, um, uh, you know, to address the, the inequities on campus and and to, you know, make this a more equitable place to study, work, and and um, you know, build community and um, and uh, you know and and you know, help to build access right for people who um, uh, don't have as as good access to. Um, you know the campus and, and to the resources here and and um, and I again I, I mean I um, you know Sarah Ahmed is talking about um, you know how the diversity well I guess in that case the diversity officer comes in and immediately they're going to be looking for their allies on campus so I think that anybody on this call you know who's obviously interested in equity um, you know I think it's it's uh, it's up to us to also um, you know, welcome that individual and, and you know, to, to be able to work with them. Uh, but, but yeah, Glenda's right. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not going to be a, you know, a one person savior. Um, it, yeah, it'll have to certainly be a, a collective effort. And I mean, I'll just, I'll just add here to um, that the, the piece that felt very important to me as I was thinking about letters. Um, and I will I will plug this article because it's been so <laughs> generative to me is, is Rita DeMoon's piece on racism as a workload and bargaining issue. And I think, I think just in terms of thinking about the possibilities of EDI, institutionalized EDI and what, what that does, um, the first thing I'll say is that that the letters are just an opening, right? Like this talk is about letters, but it's not really about letters, right? So the letters is just an opening to talk about kind of what, how the academy is working upon us, right? And in this particular iteration of the letters, I'm talking about how the EDI academy is working upon us. And so I think, I think one of the ways that I, I hope that, you know, we come away from this, this um, conversation with, is just this idea that, that um, the letters are speaking about work and labor and the university does not want to speak about work and labor. And that's for so many reasons, right? And one of them is that it doesn't want to speak back to a collective and it doesn't want a collective to speak back. And so I think 
I think that, of course, um, as Amy's question is a really good question, right? Because it speaks to the potentials and the risks of having EDI structured in those particular kinds of ways and how that can rehabilitate an institution or um, allow uh, an institution to say something about itself that just perpetuates those same power dynamics. And so of course there's that dimension where, yeah, you, you, you kind of, you do want to have a structured EDI office, but there's also, um, this question about, okay, well, what is EDI, especially when we just bundle it together in, in those words, like what is happening when we take equity, diversity and inclusion and we put them together in that package? Well, something really powerful is happening and it's happening not just to what those kind of the lineages of struggles that those words represent, but it's something that's happening to all of us. And in part, what's happening is the erasure of our work. So I think that, um, you know, and I, I, I would, I, I see people here from U of A and from my own university, U of C, um, obviously ULATH um, and elsewhere as well, but particularly in this Alberta context where you have unions that are constantly under attack by the state. I think that it, one of the things that I hope we do with the letters, with the letters not being the letters, just the physical letters, but that opening is to think about, okay, well, what, what do we need to, to think about in terms of the relationship between equity, diversity, inclusion, or equity, or inequality, or racism, or trans misogyny, et cetera, and labor. And I think that becomes a really powerful entry point that, I, again, I will really thank Rita de Moon for writing this like seminal, seminal piece that I think everybody should read because it is so generative in terms of um, you know, just looking at this one manifestation of labor, which is in the form of the letters. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions there that, that you'd like to address? Well, I, I see that we're also coming up on time, so I don't want to, to um, So Lori Atkin um, writes that we should imagine, can we imagine what would happen if we archived all our letters to the institution in a common space um, as part of the institutional memory of, of ULF or UVA or UFC? And imagine if you did a comparative study of all of the letters between all of those universities. <laughs> Just imagine it. <laughs> And, and that, that kind of speaks to Anita, Anita Gerben, who's writing um, that she's saying, is there some other creative dream work that offers a breach of even the third form of letter, like a breach mm. of logos? Mm. I don't know if you want to, to speak to that. Nina always asks good questions. I feel like <laughs> Nina probably could answer. I know that Nina could probably imagine something beautiful. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. I think also the one thing I would say too is that that our response here today, and I don't know what the response is, but has been around visibility of the letters, which I understand is is that kind of like thrust. But there's also risks, right, in terms of which letters become visible and at what time and what they reveal too. So I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I would be, I don't know what to say to your, your comment, Anita. I think what, the, when you speak about the letter as an expression of yourself, um, any form could actually do. So you could have a story, you could have a, a, a poetry, you could, uh, you could even write a, you know, a song or something. Yeah. Well, I create a way of trying to turn these letters into a stage play would be great, actually. Oh. Um, but I think letters are important because, um, because they they lie at the very heart of Western culture, Western academic culture. When when we write letters, yes, they are. Um, structured writing and special form of writing, but we know that that they, at the very least, 
will be taken seriously because that's what we do like at the institutions, administrative um, authorities will take those letters into account. At least they're bound by responding. That's why actually we are writing letters. So I don't know if in that sense is there another form that can be taken seriously by the administration. So that's why I think letters are important. That's why we are putting so much emphasis on letters. It is a form, not, not a creative form necessarily. We are called to do, to write letters. Like it's the administration calling us to write letters. It's not our own call to write the letters. And, and I'm gonna kind of wrap things up on that note. Um, who's calling you to write the letters? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we feel compelled to write the letters and what should we do with the letters? And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nisha Nath once again for joining us here today. And I'm so happy that this talk finally happened. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Thank you everyone who attended and thank you to all our panelists for your insights and your, your comments and all of the things that you shared with us tonight. I really appreciate it. And once again, thanks to um, Women Scholar Speaker Series for providing all the technical support and the additional uh, funding to make this this evening happen so thank you thank you to everyone and with that i think we'll sign off